So welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. Today uh, is h5p.org interactivity for press books. And yeah, and remember to turn off that speaker in the black in your blackboard library. John, which speaker? Uh, settings. Oh, wait, no, it's, uh, 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 yeah, it's settings. And it's then like two volume down. Uh -huh. zero. And that way all of the microphone ones. Are we good? 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 Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's try that again. So the topic of conversation today is two sort of separate but interrelated things. Um, the first is h5p.org, which is a way to increase interactivity, but we're going to do it within Pressbooks. So to get some familiarity in the room, um, for, is this any, for anyone's first time with either H5P or with Pressbooks? New users, awesome. Do we have uh, medium users with H5P or, and or Pressbooks? Familiar, familiarity. Familiarity and diamond medallion status. <laughs> and, and Mallory, would you mind introducing yourself and welcome back to the class? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm Mallory Conlon. I am a learning technology consultant on the Learn at UW team, and I primarily support Pressbooks and H5P integrations, which is what we're talking about today. So I can answer any questions that you have about it. Mallory is the, the expert. <clears throat> so um, we're going to start off with some quick introductions. We're a smaller group today um, than anticipated, so that's awesome. Um, we're going to flip a little bit of the lab. Um, it's going to be a little bit more conceptual. Why interactivity? What's the value to it anyway? And then get into some clear examples of um, press book usage, H5P interactivity, and then sort of working our way back out, especially for new users to sort of piddle around and tinker with, uh, with the technology, and then discuss sort of what are some of the challenges that you would envision for uh, your own project. So since we already started with Mallory, Bridget, can we start with you? Yeah, hi, I'm Bridget. I work in uh, learning support services in LNS, and I am their instructional designer. I just started a couple weeks ago, and I'm welcome. Gonna be, thank you. I'm going to be charged with working on the um, new undergraduate online um, curriculum. So. Awesome. Welcome. I'm Lauren Rosen, and uh, something like 25 years ago, I worked for LSS. Okay. <laughs> I'm upstairs nice. from you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I direct the Collaborative Language Program, which is a system-wide program for languages. Um, and uh, H5P came around, and I have to say that was uh, one of the best things that I had seen in decades mm -hmm. for interactivity and concept check kinds of things, assessments for students. Um, I do not use it within Pressbooks okay. um, because system doesn't, that's not what our usage is. Mm -hmm. um, our usage is actually embedded within Canvas directly with an LTI. Okay. My question for today is about the message that we got saying something to the effect of H5P in Pressbooks in Chrome uh, yeah. is going to be problematic. And so what I want to know, is it H5P in Chrome? Is it Pressbooks in Chrome? Or is it just the combination of the two? Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that for okay. sure. And also at the end of May, there's a huge event happening in Madison. Yes. H5P um, related. The H5P International Conference will be at uh, Memorial Union here okay. in Madison. Uh, registration is already going on and we've got somewhere around 200 people so far that are attending from all over the world. Mm -hmm. okay. um, awesome. It should be really awesome. Okay. You should all come. Sarah. I am Sarah. I'm a graduate student in French and Italian on the French side. And um, I have some, this semester was kind of my first semester using H5P in press books okay. and um, with hypothesis also. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mario. I'm Mario. I'm an instructor in the biochemistry. This summer? Okay. Is it a high enrollment course, small enrollment? Uh, I don't know. It's relative. So last summer we had like 130. I don't know if that's considered high. That's, that's massive, yeah. Don't look at my eyes. I'm used to 15. <laughs> Eric, help me. Uh, Eric, yeah, and I'm a prof on um, actual nutritional sciences. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a class that will come to the massive. Okay. So I'm <laughs> interested in learning new technology that might help. Awesome. And I have never heard of Neither. Awesome. Press book or IP. Okay, perfect. Peter, welcome oh, back. Thank you, man. 
Peter Van Venna. I come from a kinesiology teaching uh, neuroscience related courses. And I've been using Pressbooks for a while. And I didn't have known about H5P for a while, but I have not found time to make a start of it. But <coughs> my, my intentions are good. <laughs> I'll hopefully get started today. Some good examples. Awesome. Good. Hi, I'm Lynn. I teach in the biochemistry department. And over the past year or so, I have um, developed a press book for my biochemistry lab course so that students don't have to purchase a, essentially a course pack. That was the lab manual before. Mm -hmm. um, so I used press books as a platform for that, and H5P was really easy to integrate into it. So I think I'll show some examples in a little bit of some of the kinds of H5P interactivities that I um, put into my press book. And the question that I always have um, is how much interactivity is too much, or how do you decide how mu you know the right amount of interactivity to integrate into things like that? Awesome. Shoko. I'm Shoko Miyagi, and um, I'm in HR department in UW system. And I'm interested in H5P, <coughs> but I don't have any access. Um, and so I've been intrigued by it, and I want to try it out, and I tried a free version. So this whole access thing is uh, still an issue for me. I guess I don't, I'm not in a Madison instance. So we'll talk. Yep. <laughs> so that one. And then the interactivity part would be great because what I'm trying to build out is something super boring, like harassment <laughs> laws and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, but like you said, like how much interaction is too much when people just have to check the box that yeah. they sit in mm -hmm. this class. Yeah. So that's kind of where I am. And uh, last but never not least, absolutely. <laughs> Cliff Cunningham, work with Learn at UW team, work alongside um, Mallory, but I'm more on, uh, I'm not, I'm not directly connected to the press book, so uh, anything I learn here is good just to provide good support. All right, so what I want to move on to next is just sort of a, more of a get the ball rolling. John and <laughs> I'm John Martin. <laughs> 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 I have a very important <laughs> question, and that is for the people who have created these H5P instances and interactions. What percentage of your effort was based on learning the technology and doing it, and what percentage was based on what kind of thing should I ask? How should I ask it? What are the elements of, your, of this? The reason that I'm asking this is because I'm looking at having students create H5P instances, and I'm wondering, am I gonna make them spend so much time on the platform, learning the platform side? Or am I going to have, are they going to be spending most of their effort thinking about how do I represent the knowledge that I have? So as a, as a sort of a way to show their learning, is it too much technical effort to make them do that? Yes, very good. And we'll dig into that later. Yeah, and my partner in crime, Margaret. Well, I'm Margaret. I'm here to support the active teaching lab. And um, I'm also very into, uh, interested in how to integrate it seamlessly into the course so that it's not a burden to the learner and so that it aligns with the objectives of the of the topic or activity. Awesome. Okay. So just to get the, the ball rolling, and I'm more I'm very interested in the individuals who are here for the first time that really have no experience with H5P and with Pressbooks, the general theme or topic of interactivity and what that would look like in your course. I think you said you're teaching this summer and you're also developing, Eric, are you developing a course for this summer or for later? The fall? It's a course that has been around for oh, wow. six decades. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so a way to enhance this course. All right. So I'd like to, for you to take a few minutes, maybe just five, to think about some of these questions of, you know, is interactivity H5P just a shiny new object, a cool thing that we're interested in? Um, in your specific classroom context, either a massive course of 113 or a smaller French course of 15, what does interactivity look like? Is it all always online? Could it be in a face-to-face -face interaction mediated through technology? And how does it, digital interactivity help students meet your learning objectives? So in, um, Lynn, sort of in your past examples, what are, um, how do you measure that? But also the conditional would uh, for you, Mario, as well, if never having used it, and also for Bridget as well in your instances, do you think it would help students uh, meet learning goals? It's sort of a, a devil's advocate question. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about those questions, and then we'll sort of move into a larger <coughs> quick discussion before we see some concrete examples. 
and there's little pens and pads. Just so if you could write down your thoughts first before we move into a small share. And Peter, if you want to work with Eric. And Sarah, if you want to work with And whenever you and your sort of table-ish mate, or you're in between two tables, but if you want to work with Cliff, or... I'm busy. Yeah, I'm busy. I think working with me I'm busy. Let's do a group of three here. Okay. And then can we do a group of three over in the corner? Sure. Yeah. And then you two as well? Pardon? Do you want to talk to somebody yeah. who has like a clown we'll big class with your own question? That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm newish in college. Yeah. 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 Yeah
the They are, so they're kind of rolling it out as, you know, so, yep, yep, so they're all kind of on deck, but it's a different, different type of thing. Yep, definitely. New questions? Right on. Yeah. It's all old news. So there's really nothing. All right, so before we look at some really awesome examples of Pressbooks and H5P all together, mis mix matched in very intense ways, um, for some of your own conversations, I heard that interactivity is a way to reduce the dullness of an activity, so HR compliance or sort of, I don't want to say the tedious steps in a lab manual, but uh, just the steps in a lab manual. What are some of the other ways that interactivity looks like in your classroom context? Peter and Eric, what did you two talk about? Uh, we, we talked about the, the, you know, to get the people to discuss issues, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just passively listen to something that you can present. And so, the, the, you know, like the press books and the, the interactivity <coughs> that's associated with that is kind of like setting the basis for, you know, intelligent discussing issues. Awesome. So would that be a way, so uh, an in-person conversation that's mediated through technology, or are they sort of both in their dorm rooms or in their apartments discussing synchronously at the same time? Um, it's mostly asynchronous, but okay. I, you know, like both. I mean, it's kind yeah, of like ideally. preparing the students for you know, teamwork and interactivity. Awesome. And then for the three of you, interactivity is this a shiny object. I think, I think Lauren's going to say no. <laughs> no. What do you think? You guys can speak. We're good. Well, I was saying it's it's not a shiny new object. Um, like the concept is already there. there. It's it's always desired. Interactivity is always desired there. Um, I'm thinking of it from the um, like from assignments of just close reading mm -hmm. and for literature classes and language classes. And but I do think that H5P has the kind of shiny face to it just because it's so intuitive and. The blue box format of like questions is just—it's just recognizable and easy to use. So. So I guess in that instance, in the case of a close reading, the interactivity is not with between individuals, sort of what Peter is asking for. It's between what? It's between the individual and the text, mm -hmm. um, and then you have sort of like an instructor's analytical guide, sort of making things pop out to you and sure. asking you to pause for a second and consider something. Um, so it, yeah, it makes the reading as though you were reading alongside someone. So it was a collaborative. Or, mm -hmm. Awesome. So your first impressions. Yeah, um, so my thought was very similar to Cliff's impact. Um, we had sort of the same idea that yes, in a way, it's a shiny new object, mm -hmm. um, but it really just matters in how it's executed mm -hmm. um, so that it doesn't become like a distraction or takes away from the outcomes that you really want your students to get. Yeah, it kind of brings me to the <coughs> too much thing, Yeah, right? exactly. So, I was going to say, I think that's yeah. where it gets to the question, what is too much, too much, but um, where is it? It was there. It'll come back. It'll come back. It'll come back. Awesome. Yeah. So. So for those of you that are John, yes. I was thinking about uh, I know it's like Shoko's question. Uh -huh. um, being in compliance, you don't you have a lot of content that is generally individual students and their devices and going <laughs> through that, yeah. and uh, they don't have the other student or the option to to talk to other students as much and to have that sort of human interaction. Mm -hmm. um, Human interactions are always way more sharp, I guess, uh, contextual. <coughs> they can sort of push back on different elements that they pick up 
Whereas a pre-programmed interactive object, you can't pick up on those nuances sort of where somebody's at, so you sort of have to do a best guess of this is what I think that they'll talk about. But any sort of pushback is better than no pushback of a blank text. So in a closed reading, if they're just reading and they don't have any place to go when they run across a word that they don't understand or a way that an argument is formulated, mm -hmm. they don't have another student to sort of push back against. Anything would be better than nothing. I think. I'm curious why you say push back. Push back a uh, challenge. Because um, in the case of a close reading, it's sort of, I'm stuck, I have this problem, I don't understand the argument. It's not necessarily a form of resistance. I mean, it could be a form of resistance if you want to go that direction, but. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I, I, I guess the pushback is the, um, if I think I understand something, but then I do a rollover or whatever, and I mm -hmm. see that I didn't understand that, I take that as I guess feedback. Sure, yeah. yeah. Feedback is what I'm looking for, not pushback. What's a close reading? What am I, what is the best thing? A close reading is um, when you're looking at both the form of what is written and then the content of what is written, and you're trying to like make meaning between the two. So, simplest example, if I see in a poem, alliteration, right? All the same sounds are happening. I see that all the same sounds are happening, but then how does that attribute anything to the meaning of, of what's being expressed? So in terms of literary analysis, well, that's kind of what it is. Well, I think that's another example. As an English major and <coughs> masters, we read a lot for, um, there's a lot of, there's a different way of reading that than reading understand arguments that are created, theory and research. Like it's a totally different okay. way to look at things. So when I came into grad school, I had no idea how to read research. And having somebody step me through like, this is what's happening here, and this is what's happening here, I didn't understand that. Okay. And at a close reading, I thought that would be a great idea. You could do a close reading on an infographic, though. Yeah. It doesn't have to be an right. right. extended yeah. text. Okay. Mm -hmm. a film or a <laughs> painting. I don't want to sidetrack. I, I'm, I, oh, I think there's part of to learn here. So, but yeah, I mean, but it is a, it's not really a sidetrack because this is a functionality of it. You could do without press You could do oh. Yes. I mean, exactly. Well, yeah, that's that's why I asked the question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can add the interactivity using something like H5P. Yeah. To Hot spots on an image. Right. Right. So we are, so for those of you that are new to Pressbooks and H5P, we're gonna go through a, a quick example, um, just to give you an idea of what that's looking like. I'm gonna show just a very, I have a, a blank text that I've, what is it, Press? Mallory, what is this? Plural, wisc.pb.unison.org. No, oh my goodness, really? It's yeah, really good it, it, sh it showed up, yeah. So I'm still like at this stage of nesting dolls. Like, what's, what should I, what should I use as a jumping off? Like, you know what I mean? What's the container? The container is press books. Okay. If you oh, want to sure. use a centrally it's supported, system, it doesn't have to be. But okay. the container in Madison is press books. Right. Okay. And if you don't want to pay for it, it's this. <laughs> well, press books. That's not entirely true either, because you can do it in Canvas and not pay for it. With the free version, yes. Okay, so before the the nitty gritty details, I don't want to lose the the new user. So Pressbooks is very to me. It seems like a, very much like a blog. Um, it's a web, it's sort of a web to me. This is my elementary perspective on it. It's sort of a web page where you can contribute as much text, images, videos, really beautiful things. Um, this is an example of a Pressbook, um, a group of Pressbooks that I worked with in the French department. Uh, there's a French professor in the department um, who created uh, these press books that are sort of similar to close reading in French literature for his undergraduate courses. If you just visually sort of look at the page, it's not very, it's not necessarily the most exciting. It's just sort of a little bit of text, right? So imagine in your course you have introduction to a lab material or introduction to a module in the online finance, personal mm -hmm. finance. Mm -hmm. This is sort of basic text that, you know, mm -hmm. is just sort of that. Um, some an examples of interactivity that you can layer on top of this just to make things more complicated. Um, highlighting things like this in Mallory, please help me if I'm going wrong. Um, these sort of highlighted words, you click them and the magic appears over here on the right. 
um, where you can ask a question to students and give sort of a self-check in the way that Lauren described it. Um, and this is an example of an H5P activity that you can create and sort of layer into Pressbooks. So it's a way to have content with a form of assessment um, that can either link, well, that can link to the gradebook in a very convoluted, complicated way, I think. Um, and so that's sort of a basic presentation. Have I lost mm -hmm. anyone? And there so will far. be a separate active teaching lab on that annotation panel, mm -hmm. which is called Hypothesis. So you don't have to use Hypothesis to have H5P in your text. And this is an yes, example. Exactly. So just sort of scrolling down again, there's an audio file within the Pressbook images. Um, and then here, this is an example, like Mallory just mentioned, of an example of an H5P activity embedded within Pressbooks. So oh. as a way to scroll down and continue I don't want to say scroll-a-thon, but it could be a scroll-a-thon. You're just sort of continuing going down to the bottom of the page. <laughs> um, you can just embed it there. Yes, sir? Can you, uh, for the press book, this is a press book's question. Can a student or whoever is using it, can they like convert it into a PDF and then print it out if they don't want to read it online? Yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, you lose the interactivity, obviously, so the questions won't show up. In, or it will show up, but the student won't be able to see if they're correct. Um, but you can export it as a PDF or as an EPUB as well. As the students are viewing it, can they highlight and mark and bookmark? and they Only if you on? have Hypothesis enabled. <clears throat> we have a lab coming up on Hypothesis, as Mallory said. We also have a lab on Pressbooks, specifically Pressbooks versus uh, the engaging text mm -hmm. on Merch. Oh. Mm. I have to make sure. And I think. Lynn, I think in past labs you've mentioned that some students prefer the paper copy of the press book. Would you mind sharing that, I guess? Yeah, so I, um, I kind of mentioned that I use my press book as a lab manual that replaces a, what used to be like a bound copy that they, could, that they had to purchase. So I still give them the option of purchasing a bound copy. Um, and I think, so last fall was the first time I did this, and I think like 12 out of 90 students actually purchased it. Um, and I, I sort of expected some, some small group of people would like to have like a physical hard copy. So I still gave them that option. And then I also provided them with all of the PDFs for the individual labs so that they could download those and print them off themselves. And so some subgroup of students also um, would just like print the PDFs every week and bring those to lab. So I think giving them options is mm -hmm. good. That's great. And be because it's based on WordPress, it really translates very nicely to mobile or tablet or, you know, all these different formats. They can print it off, they can have it on mobile, tablet, laptop, whatever they want. So for the new users and for the, the frequent flyers, I'm ready to move on to more elaborate, beautiful examples. Yes? Yes, sir. More of a technical question. Can you control access? Yeah, so access is only granted to people with .wisc.edu email accounts. Um, so if you embed it in Canvas, like in your Canvas course site, then only your students will be able to see that, the, the we'll site. It, well, it'll automatically register <coughs> them. When they well, click on the link, well, it will... Registered in the class, yes. Yeah, whoever's registered in the class would see it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, and they don't need like a separate registration to access Pressbooks. They'll just automatically access it through your Canvas course site. Mallory, can you add a password on Pressbook yes, as well? Yes, you can. Okay. You can make it password protected as well. So then if you really only want certain people to see it, um, or if you want to share a link with external users, you can give them a password as well. <coughs> I'm thinking about copyright issues. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, copyright is a big concern. <laughs> uh, the second question is, can you make that question with Google? Yes, you can. So um, if you use Kaltura, um, you can embed the videos inside of an H5P question and inside of Pressbooks as well. And you said if you have it in Kaltura, is that exclusive only to Kaltura? You can also embed with YouTube, but for many reasons we don't recommend embedding directly from YouTube. For example, <coughs> somebody who owns the media might remove it and you then are you don't have video. Um, also, um, certain countries and military bases don't allow YouTube access, so if you're teaching online, then uh, those students are restricted from <coughs> viewing the content. So, Sarah, can we start with your example? Yeah. yeah. So, in the uh, this is a 300 level literature course, 
And um, this was just one of the assignments that students were given um, for one day. This is the first five pages of the novel that they started. And so if you take a look at the text, we just, because it's an excerpt, it's okay. We just essentially copied out an excerpt from the first five pages of the, of the book. Um, so students um, have an actual text copy, but then they also have activities that they have to do for certain passages. So this one, um, we embedded all of our H5P questions into hypothesis. So um, the reason why we did that is because it leaves the text kind of mm -hmm. whole, mm -hmm. and it doesn't visually interrupt it unless you open the hypothesis <coughs> annotation pane. Um, it also allows for um, just like, um, it allows for all of the discussion and annotations and um, sort of back and forth between students and between students and the faculty member to happen all in one place. So when you click on, for example, the first highlighted, you're, um, we've embedded a um, YouTube video. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, we embedded a YouTube video that just is like, who is Amelie Noton? That's the author. Um, here is an example of, uh, this is actually Professor Gibson Jennifer, who um, was sampling this out for her students in class to show them how to use the annotation. Um, so she, you know, she highlights cheval, which means horse, and then she's like, am I crazy? Like, what is this about? And then um, students can reply, I can reply, and then, you know, someone else can embed another video to say, hey, you're not crazy, I did find out why she's talking about a horse. Mm -hmm. So, I'm thinking back to yesterday's lab on effective discussions, and this strikes me as a really good example of that re redefinition of an online discussion yeah. mm -hmm. based around this primary object. Yeah. You know, it's right there front and center. It's yeah. not having a discussion in a form that's so separate. It's right yeah. there, so yeah. the reference is right wow. there. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you can essentially, you can have a discussion in this in this panel, or you can just have like comments that this is a student who made a comment about something here. Um, and then here you'll see this is uh, where the instructor inserted an H5P question. So this is comprehension check. A multiple choice comprehension check. Um, here is another comprehension check. Just to say Pékin is actually Beijing, you know, that, that's just the French word, or French version. And then, um, so you have all these comprehension checks along the way. Can I ask you a question about those? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of links back to Margaret's question earlier. I guess, why is this needed? Like, what is, how does this meet the learning objective of the course? Yeah. Just coming, why do you have only, you know, four or five pages that are excerpted? Why certain comprehension check questions? Would you maybe discuss a little yeah. bit like the pedagogical rationale. rationale for why you did that? Yeah. Um, well, so we want to, uh, like, the end objective is analysis and for students to sort of read something, analyze it, have something to say critically thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But in a foreign language class, often your first sta stage is actually just basic comprehension. So you have to get through comprehension before you can actually achieve any analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what this section is, is so th the rationale behind why these five pages, these are the first five pages of the novel. Mm -hmm. So the exposition. So it kind of it introduces, it walks students through the first five pages. Mm -hmm. And um, helps to just give students footing. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the, the objectives for using H5P for us is to foreground some <coughs> comprehension, to allow for analysis to take place that usually happens in um, like their write-ups or in forum, more formal discussion forums on Canvas mm -hmm. or in class or something. Because what I'm also thinking too is that this interactivity also teaches them how to read. Mm -hmm. And so they understand sort of that there's maybe an explanation of the processes to which you've gone through these steps, the reason why you're asking <coughs> these, you know, I don't want to say basic comprehension questions, but comprehension questions it's because it leads to that sort of creation stage mm -hmm. of critical thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, totally. Quick follow up question, mm -hmm. <laughs> just to make sure I understand. So they have a 
textbook to reading the first five pages, mm -hmm. and here you have a summary of helping them to understand those five pages. That's what's written over there to the left. It's the actual Actually, track this text. is the text itself. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's, that's fine. There's no copyright issue with putting that into the... No, just because it's a section, like a t the little excerpt of it. Okay, and you the required them they have the book. Right. And they have the book. Yeah, that makes it good. To those, to, to continue on. Wait, so that's say actually... Say that what was the question? Yeah. No, the question was the, the the questions that she has that are associated with the text. Do the students have to answer any or all of those questions, or can they just skip them? Or? So that actually, they are not required to, um, because we don't have it embedded with the LTI. So we're not actually grading them on any of these H5P questions here. Um, it's really just there. They do it, and we don't tell them that their answers go nowhere. We just. <laughs> you just hope um, they do them. We just hope yeah. they do it, and the, the feedback on it is that they love them uh, because they help them understand the text. Mm -hmm. And then, if you do want to actually check that they've done it, we have a Canvas quiz at the end of the module, mm -hmm. and it often is essentially verbatim a lot of these questions, and students know that. So, so it's in their interest to it's actually in their do interest. This. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have a point. To uh, tag on to Jim, uh, John's question about the online discussion thing, the you know the modification or the redesign of the discussion, you know, like so I, I think you know I like the idea of this annotation panel, but if you have a class of a hundred people, mm -hmm. you know, are going to be commenting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you lose the <coughs> direction in which the conversation is going, Definitely. you know, and so also you would kind of like. You know the questions that the instructors in that mm -hmm. um, it might be you know down the road a couple of pages mm -hmm. and so how do you deal with that if this was a class of about 19 people um so that's definitely important this was also the first time we ever tried having them discuss the text within the text uh -huh. mm -hmm. um and yeah it was just um we'll see how it goes this was a blended class so we still saw we still met face to face and it changed definitely your preparation for the face-to-face -face time because you had to sort of see what was going to happen when students were reading, and you kind of had to keep up with it a little bit. I imagine you can figure out some sort of grouping mm -hmm. the same way that you would in a, a regular discussion, yep. <coughs> but I don't know, that might be a better question for the hypothesis lab. Yeah, that could be, yeah, yeah. I think there are ways, like we created this private group just for the class itself. You can create private groups. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. You can also, so another way around it is that one assignment once was that um, students had to, you know, um, make some kind of comment in the annotations page, and every student's comment actually has a, a um, URL, mm -hmm. has a link share to it, mm -hmm. and so one of the assignments was take a discussion post that you are proud of, you've maybe made like 10, pick one that you're proud of, and just add the link to our Google Doc, and then that was like the fuel for discussion in class. Because it'll take you straight there once you click on it. Going back to Mario's question about is it required or, and if it's not required, do they do it? Um, so we are talking to students this semester, and um, we just did a survey. We had 300, about 350 people fill it up. 55% of them said that they love self-quizzing. They love quizzing options that don't have grades associated with it because it's a, a low stakes way for them to test their knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think this is fitting in with that. Mm -hmm. You know, 55% is not 100%, but it was just things that they mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it, it was volunteer, it wasn't even a choice that we asked. Them. And then just to add on to that, for some, some of the feedback that you can give, you can personalize it for your students as well. You can enable retry buttons or don't show the final answer until all of the activities have been completed. So you can adjust that sort of self-check in ways that are a little bit constricted, um, but at the same time giving them you know, direct and immediate feedback, which is, is always very useful for students. And then to see some of those examples, Lauren, could be yes. your yeah. thing, sir. Uh, yeah. Do you have the activity sheet up there? Because I just added my link yes. to it. Uh -huh. um, and we'll see how that works rather than plugging in. Thank you, sir. Um, mm -hmm. So Shoko and I um, don't, work with people necessarily that have a WIS.edu account. Mm -hmm. um, so H5P, you can, 
use the free version of it. It's self-check. You don't get any analytics. <coughs> mm. If you're in Madison, you can use it and get support within Pressbooks. If you're outside of Madison, UW System has approved legally H5P, but there's no support around it outside of whatever your unit is, mm -hmm. okay? So my unit purchased the LTI so that we could get the analytics and embed it directly into Canvas. Right? Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the analytics or showing you that, but I wanna show you some other things within H5P that you haven't seen yet um, and why I think it's so powerful. Um, so first off, There's, so we use a lot of the interactive activity or interactive video and course presentation. We're using that a lot because um, a lot of the instructors I work with are flipping their lessons. Mm -hmm. So it gives the student the opportunity to learn outside of class. When they come into class, you can have the oral, I'm a language teacher, so a lot of the oral interaction can happen because the students have um, learned the lecture type of information prior to that. I'm going to show you some examples of both of those. Within interactive video and course presentation, many, many of these activity types can be added. And so what you have seen so far are some of these activity types, but you haven't seen it into the bigger envelope. So that's what I want to show you. Um, I'm going <coughs> to... This is um, Shannon Spasova. She's at um, Michigan State in Lansing, and she is a powerhouse when it comes to H5P activities for her Russian class. Um, and I'm gonna, so this whole page, which you can certainly, you know, play through and look at the different types. I wanted to go to this one in particular because this is an interactive video. Um, this is for first semester, first year Russian students. Um, I'm going to start playing it, um, and these little dots down here, mm -hmm. those represent spots where the video is going to pause mm -hmm. and some kind of activity is going to pop up. So I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I'm going to jump through it a little bit so you can see some of the differences. Would we have sound from here? There we go. Okay. Um, so you can pop up and just have explanatory text. Um, when, where needed. Um, this here, she's got two different activity checks that pop up, um, and they have to look at, for example, for this one, they have to look at this in the video to be able to respond correctly. Um, let's see, there's another one in here, if I can find it, in particular that I Um, okay, so she can take um, an authentic document and embed that in there too with more information as it's connected to the video. So there's lots of different things that you can do within that. Yeah, John? Is that document then you click on it and it opens up in a new window? I don't think so. Okay, but it's just sort it's, of it's just, So this, in this particular case, this is something that is very common in schools in Russia that students use for classes and she just wanted to show them what the what real thing is because that's what the little girl is writing in. Mm -hmm. So that was the point of putting that in there. So anyway, there's lots of different um, activity types that go then get embedded right within the video, the video pauses, whatever. Now Shannon um, has been using this for several years. She's got a ridiculous number of activities. She does everything as self-check because her institution has not purchased the LTI. And then in her situation, like what um, Sarah was explaining, it's embedded in their course management system and then she does a, a quiz within the course management system to find out what they actually knew after having experienced um, the H5P activity. Uh, so, yeah. um, this is one which shows uh, the presentation style. Um, Check that. Um, this 
is where I have to see if I can remember my login and password. So give me a second. <coughs> One more possible try here. Sort of in between time, um, on the activity sheet, um, a lot of these links and introductions and sort of step-by-step -step processes are available on the digital on the digital version. So just sort of how to do it, step-by-step uh, -step ex explanations and instructions with links to explanatory tutorials that H5P offers to new users. Um, all that's available on the, obviously the digital copy because as John always says, the links are here. We've got easy ones, Try an easy one. If you've got some questions. familiarity and you want to challenge yourself, there's a medium one yeah. on okay. putting a, uh, finding a hot spot, uh, for marking the words, and then if you're really going for a high-end thing, branching scenarios, that's very difficult to keep track of just the branches, but it's a good challenge. I'm sorry, my desktop's a mess. Okay. It's, 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 uh, so, uh, is this um like a loading like a because this it's a very digital media heavy, does that influence if people are mm. tuning in from like how long it know, takes for it to load? Oh, or by log with my modem. Yeah, Bayfield or somewhere. Yeah, if it's in Pressbooks, we don't typically have any loading issues when there are live. I haven't H5 had any loading questions. issues in Canvas either. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's not like Flash or whatever we're yeah. using. Okay. No, you don't get the spinny. Your computer's yeah. dead. <laughs> yeah. um, this is uh, the uh, interactive presentation. Um, so in language classes, uh, one of the trickier things to teach is uh, grammatical concepts when you don't want to be using English. Okay? Mm -hmm. So one of the nice things about this whole flipping lessons idea is that the instructors can take the times when they need to be in English outside of the classroom so they can spend all of their contact time in the target language. Mm -hmm. So this is an example in Russian where she was teaching some concepts outside of um, class and the students just flip through these slides. It's kind of like a regular slideshow. Mm -hmm. But then she can have interactive elements that explain things along the way. She can have concept check questions that pop up. Um, She's got a variety of types here. I'm gonna, here's another type of concept check question. And she can embed them in all the slides, some of the slides, basically however often she wants them to be there. Um, so that's, that's what the interactive presentation piece looks like. Laura and, Mallory, okay. do you know, can you just upload a PowerPoint slide that you've already created into this? Or do you have to create them in this platform? I believe you have to create it in the platform. Okay. Yeah, because it's not it's not affiliated with Microsoft, so right. PowerPoint wouldn't work in there. Yeah, or it was a good question. Or, um, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The interface is very is very similar to Adobe Captivate. Sort of yeah. that. Um, but it's it's not a challenge, but it's not. I don't think it's very user friendly in my for personal making case. the course presentation. Yeah, it's just yeah. really clunky. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it it gets the job done. Right. But it's just. It's, it's not as intuitive, maybe. Right. Yeah. That's what I, I think. Learning different icons and. Mm -hmm. If I need to do a Google slide, I will create it in Keynote, export it as PD, uh, as, as PowerPoint, and then upload it, then make any fixes that I need in Google mm -hmm. slides. It's just so much easier because I prefer working in Keynote. So I was yeah. wondering if that was a. a no, I don't think you can. Very good. Thank you. This does have audio in it too. That part of H five P. I just wasn't playing it. That. So that gives some instruction as well as the pop up. So you can have multiple objects within a, a slide. Sarah, your question? 
Yeah, so just like the general question, would you embed then, so you have yeah, H5P it. questions mm -hmm. that you create, that you embed within your H5P presentation, which then you would embed into Canvas on like an HTML page, for example, or like an assignments page? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so you, you create an assignment, and then you go to external tool. Yeah. And you pick H5P yeah, if mm -hmm. you have access to it, and mm -hmm. then it select just your, you select which one of your H5P activities or interactive presentations, and it goes into that. What if you don't have access to it in Canvas? Is there a way to embed? Yes, H5P? so you can grab embed code mm -hmm. from H5P. Oh, and so from the it, website, right? From the when you create you your H5P, the H5P yeah. activity, so you can get the embed code for it just embed it. That's Madison for central support. Yeah, and her department pays yeah. for support from H5P. Wait, I can't. I can't hear. Sorry, my hearing's not that good. So the idea is you have you make an account on H5P, then you can link everything that you create in H5P to your Yes. And the, so the h5p.org site, which is the one I showed you that had all of the different activities on it, yeah. um, they, they are encouraging you after you create them to download them to your own um, laptop or whatever. And they, you can embed them into WordPress and to all kinds of different things. They want, they want you to be doing that rather than storing on their website for right now. Um, but I can tell you, Shannon, the one who did the interactive video, she has it, all of hers still sitting on, she has copies on her laptop as well, but she has all of hers currently sitting on their website and they haven't um, gotten rid of them. I know that there's gonna be some big announcements at the conference. I don't know if one of them is going to be a repository or not. Um, there are several of us in here that are in languages and I know that the International Association for Language Learning Technology is currently in the process of developing a repository for language learning objects, and we're starting with H5P. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be a place to store them outside <coughs> of the H5P website. And just sort of a related question to the repository, are you able to share, you can sort of pick an H5P activity that someone else has created and generated? And then embed that into your. Yeah. So if you have colleagues that have, you know, their own activities. In here, there's this reuse button. Mm -hmm. If I click on that, mm -hmm. it allows me to copy the content. Mm -hmm. Now, as the owner of that object, I believe I can choose whether or not I want to make that available. Um, That's only if you own it, but not if you create. If if you create it and you keep it on their site, isn't that available for everybody? Or is that one of those, mm -hmm. as long as we're hosting it, it's open for anybody? So I think it's when you create the activity that you decide whether it's something that can be okay. reused or not. Mm -hmm. Now they are, they are um, an OER company. They, they want you, they encourage you to share. That's their whole thing. The only way they, they make any money to support creating new activity types, and they encourage other people to develop new activity types, some of which will also be presented, I think, at this conference. Um, the only way they make any money is people who buy the LTI. Um, so this copy content, is, in some ways, it's like the way that I learned HTML. I found web pages and I said, this looks cool. I copied that HTML and then I went in and I changed the particulars of it. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of idea here. Yeah. And it's an assignment. Yes. This is it, yes. You do it in an assignment because, here, I'll um, pass this degree. Let me uh, go back to, she won't care if I don't save something in her thing. So Canvas might give you the spinny ball of hell, but um, H5P won't. <laughs> okay, so if I want to create a new assignment, just to show you quickly what it looks like when you've got the LTI. Um, I scroll down here um, and I do external tool. And then I can go to find and I have H5P. And then I can choose which one of my H5P activities I would want to insert there. So that's how, you, that's how you get it into Canvas when you have the LTI. Um, 
and then you don't have this game piece. Any other? <laughs> so we don't have this. Yeah. I just asked that to you. Unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. I was like, it? However, yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> you should get it, so talk to your people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? I did put the link here to the conference. I would encourage all of you to come. It's going to be really awesome. Um, and it's right here in Madison, so for you, it's pretty inexpensive. So, is anybody having students create H5P content as a learning activity that yeah. you're aware of? We've had some in system, um, especially at UW Milwaukee. They've hired students who are upper level students of Japanese who have created a ton of activities for the Japanese instructor. Okay. Um, I'm thinking of a student. But do you project. mean, like, in a, I was going to say, did you mean, like, in a class yeah. setting, like, for so an the assignment? So yeah. we had individual things within the presentation. That struck me as let's work together as a group, group of five, on a presentation, and then. You take slide one, you take the interaction or the self-check on slide two, you take the self-check on slide three. That might be kind of a fun way to yes. get them thinking about what's important, how do I And I think it. branching scenario would also be a good one. So can we do I'm that? I'm intimidated by branching scenarios. Well, so if you had a group of people and they all came up with a different ending, and yeah. then you tied them together into a branching well, scenario. You're right, that'd be smart. <laughs> So that do the students have time. access to do to do that to create the H five P? They can questions. Yeah, you can. You can set that up. Okay. Yep. Well, in so Pressbooks. Okay. Well, in on the H five P dot org, anybody can create a free account. Mm-hmm. Yes. So you but know, if you want support through Pressbooks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right. So just to, to clarify, um, you, you know, you showed us how to get the content into Canvas via this LTI link. But you know, so then it's not available, but how how you know how do we put things into Canvas if we want to? Um, so if you if you want to get the LTI for H five P outside of Pressbooks? Or can, can we? You, um, so your department would have to yeah, it. and it would also have to go through a central vetting process for the LTI to That's be the part that's already use. been done by system. But it's different. But it's different system, from Madison. Not from Madison. Oh, yeah, Madison's it, going to have a separate. It has to do its own yeah, legal we have our thing. Own <laughs> process. But a way yeah, that you could get around that is everything in Pressbooks. Yes, right. I thought you were going to say something scarier. Yeah. I would. I would hope that the vetting process in Madison would be simpler since it has gone through. System nice. legal yeah. that they've already they could share documents. <laughs> that would be cool. But yeah. I don't know because yeah. I don't know. All right. So so the way to do it is to embed it into Pressbooks press and then embed Pressbooks into, into your into yes. Canvas. So it's like Pressbooks is sort of the middle person for mm-hmm. our our setup, right? Yeah. Like we have yeah. to go through Pressbooks to yeah. get the H five P stuff into Canvas. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So then here's the strategy: you create a class Pressbook. To replace the textbook so your students don't have to buy a textbook. They're all on board with that, right? Everybody, every group gets a chapter and is responsible for their own WordPress text and an H5P presentation within that. And then the individuals within the group can all break that into pieces and boom. Right. Yes. That, cool. We did that in a grad seminar this past semester where the graduate students had to create a chapter in a shared press books and essentially what you got out of it was something that could be like a lesson plan if they were ever to teach that text they would be able to use their chapter so authentic work that they can use again yep mm-hmm. and then also it, each student has a chapter and then the whole book is sort of this edited volume if you want to yeah. call it that something for their resume yeah. a link they can send to grandma yeah. <laughs> so in the two minutes that we have left, um, I just wanted to put up these questions, just sort of uh, maybe post live reflection or things for you to think about, you know, this weekend or at a cocktail party and ask other people. <laughs> um, and I think we've addressed some of these. What are some of the obstacles that you envision for your own development of interactivity? And Peter, you mentioned this and the conversation about LTI integration and whether or not there's legal permissions in purchasing that. But do you think there's any obstacles for students in their own interactivity? We've talked a lot about behind the scenes, but all of this is necessarily for student learning outcomes. You, sort of off the top of your head, any obstacles that you would imagine? In, in my case, I sometimes worry that the students that would benefit most from cell checks are the ones who are more likely to just skip it if mm-hmm. it's not required. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't know how to 
Yeah. That's just a question that I have, I guess. Yeah. So, sort of encouraging them my to question to that is, are those the same students that wouldn't do the homework anyway? Yeah. It's a good so, yeah. whether it's in, right, what, whatever format. Or something else, it would only be so responsible, <laughs> right, yeah. for when yeah. the students yeah. yeah. If, yeah. Um, is this also um, an accessibility issue? Yeah. yeah, I wonder um, that too. H5P does pretty well accessibility wise, but the hypothesis annotations are not, not good. Accessibility yeah. in that, like um, people who are like, afford internet oh. access, computer, but yeah, also so like an, a, digital an literacy. Oh, yeah. Um, so the audience type may not be from 19 year old to 24 year old. Right. Is there anything that blocks or Kinder learning by using I this? think if you were going to ask them to create content using H5 Peer Pressbooks, that would probably be a barrier for people who are less mm -hmm. technology savvy. Mm -hmm. um, but just accessing the content is quite easy. So I don't think that would be an issue for um, for learners that don't use technology very now, much. Do screen readers work well with I H5P? With H5P, um, we did an accessibility review on it. Um, and there's um, some question types that have issues, like you can imagine hot spots or issues, things like that. that. Not um, it's not so good, and we have um, on our KB a whole list of, of accessibility what, what, so concerns. Mm -hmm. um, is that in the activation? Uh, I don't <laughs> think so, and honestly now that I'm thinking about it, I think it might be for atomic assessments and not for H5P. Um, <laughs> but there are accessibility <coughs> concerns for image questions that you yeah. would be using with really any sort of question authoring platform. Mm -hmm. um, but hypothesis does the annotations do not work properly with screen readers, so that's yeah. something so to that's consider. Big, yeah, can be a big barrier. To yeah. On what you, yeah. How is hypothesis on mobile? So I'm thinking back to Sarah's example, oh, yeah. where you have the the text right yeah, there, and then yeah. the sidebar of that. It's like if my screen yeah. is only two inches wide or three inches mm -hmm. wide, yeah. mm -hmm. that might be an issue as well. But I mean. They figured out other ways of doing that. Is it? I, I imagine it's put below it or above it the way the canvas adjusts mm -hmm. their sidebars. So, is H5P here to stay? Is, I, H, is anything here to stay? <laughs> <laughs> what was I the I my time time so, Pressbooks is here to stay for the foreseeable future. Okay. So, H5P is part of that. So, I would say yes. Okay. Yeah. Good enough for me. <laughs> well, we are officially out of time, but I will leave you with this last question. Where do you go from here? Um, for those of you that are sort of getting started and acquainted with um, H5P and Pressbooks, I'm sort of thinking about your own personal trajectory and those of you who are kind of medallion status members. Um, with H5P, sort of what's your next step? What's the new project you're working on? Um, yeah, so if you could fill out the reflection sheet, even in my door. We're going to go to the conference. Yeah. It's, um, It'll be good. It's going to be so good. The conference will have workshops, if I remember correctly, where people yes. are actually oh, in yep. a big part of it. Yeah, I do want to touch on what Lauren brought up, the Chrome issue with um, yes, H5P yes. and Pressbooks. So um, I don't know if anybody else has heard, but Chrome is going through some updates that is going to block third-party cookies by default. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it too much. <laughs> um, but basically, it prevents embedded content from being loaded into sites like Canvas. Um, so we did some pretty extensive testing, and H5P in Pressbooks in Canvas runs into some issues. So you'll be able to view um, the content, but the H5P questions will not show up. Mm -hmm. So the way to get around that for now, while H5P is working on getting their um, content to not require mm -hmm. third-party cookies, mm -hmm. Um, you just have it load in a new window, the students access the content outside of Canvas. So we lost the embeddability when you're accessing the content through Chrome, but you just have to deal with that for right now if you want them to do the H5P activities. And I did some research and it is H5P that's the issue, not Pressbooks. So you Pressbook. might want to talk with them about how that's going to affect your LTI, because it does use third party cookies. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. And if you run into issues or have questions about that, just contact the Do It Help Desk and say you want a consultation, and then you'll meet with me. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, happy weekend. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm just looking at the press book.
website. Yeah. So if I log in, am I supposed to be able to use my NetID? Or do I um, have to create an account first? So you probably don't have an account yet, so I can actually create one for you okay. right so now. <laughs> if you access the any content right. through Canvas, you it'll have so yeah, because you're already off the website. What did you say? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, okay. But because you um, probably haven't accessed anything through Canvas, I have you example. 